everyone to the quarterly discussion with Montgomery County that PRO conducts. Um, we have the privilege of having a lot of representatives from county government here today, but mostly today's program is Victor Salazar, the Division Chief of Zoning at Plan Review. Um, so would any of your bosses like to say an introduction before you get on here? Or, um, Victor, it's all yours. Great. Now I can I can start and um, and thank you for thank you for inviting the Division of Zoning and Code Compliance to present today. Um, our staff have prepared a PowerPoint presentation to introduce you to our division, providing a brief overview of our structure, introducing our leadership team, and then spending the bulk of our time discussing the disciplines um, our expertise is focused on, and concluding with what we hope to be some meaningful Q and A. Uh, I am Victor Salazar, the Division Chief for the Department of Permitting Services Division of Zoning and Code Compliance. With me today are Section Managers Greg Nichols and Patricia Wolford and Senior Plan Reviewer Amy Zhu. Um, also available are other senior leaders from DPS. Um, and if you could just raise your hand, um, our Acting Director, Asan Matazadi, our Division Chief for Land Development, Linda Kabilski. Um, Jim Sackett, our manager for residential inspections, and um, and Sonia Burke, our, our our agency's PIO. So Patricia, why don't you go ahead and bring up the presentation? And while she's doing that, just some key pieces of inf information about our department. Um, DPS is part of the executive branch of Montgomery County government reporting to the county executive, um, Mark Elrich. Our department has over 240 employees when we are fully staffed. Uh, 28, 28 of those employees work in the Division of Zoning. And the, uh, the division is divided into two sections, zoning review and code compliance. So why don't you move to the next slide? So our agenda, just to give you a little roadmap of where, where we're going today, um, I've just provided a, a, a brief overview of the division. We're gonna dig a little bit deeper. Um, Greg Nichols, our section manager for code compliance, will give you an introduction and uh, some, um, some takeaways of, uh, related to our code compliance section. And then Patricia Wolford will pick it up from there uh, and she will take the bulk of the um, presentation uh, talking about ADUs, pre-design consultation and some other things um, that uh, David had a request that we touch upon um, during one of our planning sessions. So uh, without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Greg. Greg? Greg, if you're talking, you're muted. I apologize. Again, my name is Greg Nichols. I manage the site plan and code compliance section within DPS. The bulk of this presentation today, obviously, is on ADUs and, and new construction and additions. Um, but we wanted to cover uh, a little bit of what we do as far as uh, code compliance and enforcement. The, uh, the section I manage has two distinct teams, um, the first of which uh, are in charge of ensuring the compliance for all Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission certified site plans. That uh, entails uh, meeting and working hand in hand with the development community throughout the um, life of a project from the very beginning uh, through its various stages, ensuring that all the aspects and requirements uh, of the certified site plan are followed and that the uh, phasing is conducted in such that as people begin to move in and in, uh, uh, to these developments, either in the mixed use high rises or large residential projects, they're able to enjoy the amenities um, associated with and designed within that, uh, the site plan. Um, the inspections are inc include uh, pri everything from private streets, uh, hardscape, all landscaping, lighting, all amenities, all uh, recreational facilities, things of that nature. And uh, this team also does all the building heights uh, for all new construction within the county. Um, last year, fiscally, they did just over or just under 8,000 total inspections, the bulk of which were the certified site plan inspections, the rest being uh, the building height inspections. 
The next part of our team uh, does code compliance for chapter 59 zoning. Um, and they also do uh, vendor uh, complaints as well. And basically this team responds to complaints, um, most of which are use issues uh, related to, you know, people uh, thinking they can do one thing or the other on a, on a piece of property, but they can't. Um, and we uh, guide them through the process to get uh, compliance, to, to bring any violation uh, into, into compliance and to abate all violations. Um, and that team last year responded to uh, well over uh, 1,300 service requests and uh, conducted um, and created uh, over 2,700 uh, cases. Um, as I said, the bulk of them um, have to do with use issues, but on occasion there are development standard complaints. And when that happens, or, or complaints relative to no building permits for things, uh, it's our team that goes out initially and does the triage uh, for first contact for those, for those complaints. Um, another thing that team also does is it, it inspects and uh, ensures compliance for all the conditional use and special exceptions in the county, of which we have about 800 or so. These are businesses located in homes or, or in establishments that are typically in residential zones. Um, and they have to go through um, approval. Um, the old ones were done by the Board of Appeals, the new ones all through the Office of Zoning and Administrative Hearings. Um, and lastly, when, it, when, when we can't gain compliance through cooperation, we do have an enforcement protocol. Um, our, our goal is to educate everyone first and foremost, but if that doesn't work um, and we give enough time, then we do issue uh, not only notices of violation, but civil citations, very similar to what a police officer would issue, but we check off a very important box on that, uh, the abatement order. And that'll put us in front of a district court judge eventually. Um, and the, uh, the individuals, the defendants will be able to uh, plead their case. And um, we, we are in court on a routine, regular basis. So um, we, we pride ourselves in, in being fair uh, and not capricious. <laughs> and um, uh, we try to be very consistent with our enforcement throughout the county. Um, and with that, that's, that's about it uh, for, for what our section does. And I'll go ahead and let Patricia explain what her zoning review does. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Tricia Wolford. As uh, Victor said, I'm the manager of the zoning review section. Uh, we have about uh, um, seven zoning reviewers. We're responsible for reviewing uh, and approving um, the majority of the permits that come into DPS. Those can be building permits, fence permits, uh, HVAC permits, uh, additions, alterations, ADUs, whatever, everything has to come through zoning to make sure that the use works and the setbacks work. So that's part of what we do. Um, we also provide for code interpretations. Um, we do that through zoning confirmation letters, which are typically done for finance institutions. And with those, we determine the use of a property, confirm the use, confirm whether or not there are any zoning violations on the property, if there's subject of a special exception, a conditional use certified site plan, and we provide a formal letter. We also do use and occupancy certificates. We make certain that the use is a use that's provided in the zone that it's in and, and approve that for use and occupancy. Um, we also get involved in legislation through uh, helping to write zoning text amendments, review uh, zoning, upcoming zoning text amendments. Uh, we're part of some of the committees for zone, the zoning rewrites uh, whenever parts of the code are changing. But basically, we are all zoning. Everything having to do with zoning and uses, that is what uh, our group does. I'm going to go through uh, some of the questions. I guess you had some questions with regards to ADUs, additions, and, and such like that. So I'm going to kind of first go through just uh, what, what qualifies ADUs, what some of our code requirements are for ADUs, for accessory structures, uh, fences, pools, et cetera. Um, so hopefully this is new information for some of you, helpful information. I know you have a lot of questions. So once I go through that, we'll have time for questions. 
Um, so hopefully I won't be repeating stuff that you already know. But also with me is Amy Zo. She's one of the senior zoning reviewers. Amy's a registered landscape architect, certified planner. She deals with, uh, she can do any of our zone, uh, reviews that come through zoning, but she deals with a lot of the complex cases, whether it's the demo rebuilds and infill, and she does a lot of the ADUs and additions and such. So Amy's here to keep me honest. If I'm saying the wrong thing, she'll make sure to correct me. But um, so uh, let's let's move on. Uh, I'm going to start with accessory dwelling units, accessory structures. Um, what is ma what makes an ADU eligible or qualify for an ADU in Montgomery County? It basically has to have three components. It has to be a, have a bedroom, a bathroom, and a kitchen cooking facility. We get a lot of people who come in with a detached accessory structure that they call a studio, and they put a bedroom and a bathroom in it. Is that an ADU? No, because it doesn't have a cooking facility. And a cooking facility could be a microwave. If it's something that someone could live in and have a kitchen that would have a refrigerator and a microwave and a bedroom and a bathroom, that's an ADU. Difference being if you have like in this picture here, a detached accessory structure, if it were just an accessory structure, in an R60 zone, it would have a five foot rear and a five foot side setback. If it was an ADU with the bedroom, bathroom, kitchen, then it would have to meet ADU setbacks, which is a minimum 12 foot in the rear, and it has to meet the, the side setback of a primary structure. So that's the difference between just, even though the ADU in this case would be an accessory structure. It's also an ADU, so it has a different different requirements. Licensure, it is licensed to the Department of Housing and Community Fair, Affairs, DHCA. What we require at time of building your, your permit application for the ADU is that we require that you provide the preliminary inspection report that is one of the first steps in the process of getting your licensure with DHCA. So you would first go to DHCA, get your, your um, fill out your application, get the preliminary inspection report, submit that in conjunction with all the submittal requirements that you need to obtain your building permit from us. Then we review, approve your building permit, it goes, you, you take that approval back with you to DHCA and complete the process with them in terms of the application to register and get your ADU license. They will come out and inspect the property and ultimately issue you your, your license for that ADU. Um, there are two types of uh, accessory dwelling units. You have an attached accessory dwelling unit, which basically is exactly that. It's attached in some way to the primary structure. <coughs> it either can occupy the basement, the attic, or it can physically just be an addition that's put on the house for the sole purpose of, of the ADU. Um, you, if you have a separate entrance, it, can, it has to be located at the side of the building or in the rear of the building, unless the front entrance that's separate from the primary structure entrance existed before May 20th of 2013, then you could have two entrances on the front of the house. You could also have the entrance be the same entrance as the primary structure on the front of the house, but you just can't have a secondary entrance on the front of the house for the purpose of the ADU. And I believe the intent there is so that it doesn't appear to be a duplex in a single family detached neighborhood. Um, but those would be your requirements for your entrance. In terms of maximum gross floor area permitted for the ADU, the attached, it's 1,200 square feet. Unless you're using the full basement, the basement could exceed the 1,200 uh, uh, square foot footprint. Next, you have the detached accessory dwelling unit. It's obviously detached, separate from the house, but it's it's a subordinate structure to the primary structure. If it's an existing structure that legally existed before May 31st, 2012, and legally meaning it was permitted to be constructed, 
it could qualify for an ADU and not have to meet the setbacks or the maximum floor area. It also cannot have any new windows uh, adjoining any uh, property lines that abut adjoining properties. So if it has windows that existed before May 31st, 2012, those can exist, but you cannot add new ones. You cannot enlarge the ones that are there and you can't enlarge the building in any way. Otherwise, it, a detached accessory dwelling unit built after May 30th of 2012 has a minimum rear setback of 12 feet and has side setbacks that are the minimums that the zone allows for the primary structure. If the dwelling, the, the detached dwelling unit on either length of the wall adjacent to a property line is greater than 24 feet, you will have an additional one foot of setback added to the, the minimums. So for instance, if along the rear property line where you have a, a, a 12, if you see my cursor, where you have a 12 foot setback, if this uh, length of the building were to be 26 feet, then that 12 foot setback would become a 14 foot setback because of the two foot additional. So uh, in terms of maximum gross floor area for the detached ADU, it has to be the least of the following. It's either 50% of the footprint of the principal dwelling, 10% of the lot area, or 12,000 square foot of gross floor area. And this, we will look for these computations to be on the site plan that you will provide for this. And I'll get to the site plan later, but um, you, we just wanna see that you've done each of these calculations and the size of your ADU is per showing us that you have chosen the least of those three options. Next, we get into additions, decks, pools, and fences. And um, with regards to additions, they're an addition to the primary structure. So you meet the primary structure setbacks and lot coverage requirements and everything. What I provided here is one of our uh, little cheat sheets that we call them that are, they're on our website. If you go to uh, the DPS website, if you click on zoning and code enforcement, there's a little pie wheel, click on the zoning and code enforcement, and you'll see there's a setback tab. And if you click on the setbacks, we have these cheat sheets for all zones, whether it's R60, R90, R200. And the good thing about these cheat sheets is if you go to the zoning ordinance and, and, and you find the R60 zone, it's gonna give you the minimum front sides rear setbacks. But what this includes, like right here in the R60 zone, the minimum setbacks, side setbacks are eight foot minimum, total 18 feet. But we have exemptions, which appear back in the back of the zoning ordinance, but we've included them here in the cheat sheets. So to qualify for a seven foot side setback, you're grandfathered in for that if your record plat is is recorded before January 1st, 1954. And a lot of people ask, how do I qualify for the seven foot side setback? And it, it's hard to find in the zoning ordinance if you're not good with the ordinance. So these cheat sheets are really helpful. Um, so they're a quick look at to figure out where your setbacks are. But your additions are gonna have to meet those setbacks. And again, we have the same situation where you're, uh, no, that's, a, I'm sorry, detached. I was gonna get into the 12 foot, uh, the additional setbacks, but sorry. With regards to decks, decks meet uh, primary structure setbacks with the exception of the allowance of a three foot encroachment into side yards and nine foot encroachment into front and rear setbacks. Pools are considered accessory structures. They meet, the accessory structure setbacks, that's measured to the water sur water elevation, the edge of the water, edge of water, or the pool equipment and or pool equipment. So pool equipment and the edge of water much, must meet the accessory structure setbacks. With regards to fences, a six and a half foot fence can go up to the property line. 
If it's going to be on the property line, we need letters of approval from the adjoining property owners. But anything greater than a six and a half foot fence, other than a deer fence, which is an, a specific orange plastic mesh fence, anything greater than the six and a half foot wood fence or, or whatever would have to meet accessory structure setbacks. And you get into the problem where for the length as it gets greater than 24 feet, that setback's going to increase by a foot. It doesn't work. So it you really can't you can't go greater than the six and a half feet unless unless you were to get a variance, but otherwise um, you can't meet the requirement. I spoke about encroachments with regards to decks and and um, and such. Any and these are this is straight from the zoning orange. I'm not going to read through them all, but I'm going to touch on a couple of the major ones that we get a lot of questions from everyone. Any enclosed, unenclosed porch, deck, stoop, a roofed, open, unenclosed porch or stoop can encroach three feet into a side setback, nine feet into a front and rear. A screened in porch cannot encroach at all. That's considered part of the primary structure. But if you have a porch that's open, a covered porch, it can encroach. Balconies can encroach six feet into a setback as long as the projection, the vertical, the projection on the vertical plane can, can't be any closer than two feet to the property line. Chimneys, flues, fireplaces, they can encroach two feet into the setback. And the big ones are the bay windows. They can encroach three feet into a setback as long as they aren't greater than 10 feet along the building face. And that linear facade can't have more than 50% of the facade being bay windows. So like you can't have like five bay windows down the side of the house to try and get more space because you can encroach three feet in. It, it can't be more than 50% of the linear foot of the uh, facade. Site plan requirements. I think there was a question I, I saw that uh, you asked in the pre-meeting, which I wasn't in, but I heard um, was when we require a house location survey versus a full boundary survey. A house location survey is a perfect use for fences, sheds, um, small small additions, as long as that boundary survey is stamped and sealed by a, a surveyor or a professional engineer. It needs to be scaled, show property lines, location of streets, existing proposed structures, and everything. When we would really require the full boundary and topo is when it's a new building, or it's a demo rebuild, or it's a major addition that would be like a two-story addition that we have to calculate uh, building height by utilizing average grade. So we need sea level elevations. So we would really need uh, topography at least across the front of the house. Can uh, I clarify that question a little bit? Yes, you um, can. So a house location survey frequently has a little note on it that says plus or minus one or two feet sometimes. So if I'm doing an addition and planning it right on the, uh, you know, in line with the existing house that's right on the setback line, and I've got a note that says plus or minus two feet, am I putting myself at risk? You know, suppose that whole house was built off. Right. Well, we aren't going to accept that house location survey that has the plus or minus uh, two feet. It, it would have to be a house location survey that does not have that uh, that condition on there. And I, I don't know, it seems to be, we, we get a lot of these uh, wall checks and surveys that say that, and I don't know, I, I worked 30 years running land development, civil engineering firms. We, we didn't have those tolerances of a foot or two. So um, no, that uh, uh, something like that would not be acceptable. So I guess the caveat is, we can use that house location survey 
if it's not saying it's only as accurate as up to two feet, because you're right. If you're if you have a seven foot side setback and you're gonna the house is sitting right at seven foot, it can't be six feet. It's either seven yeah. feet or it's not. Yeah. So I, I it, you know, it, we wouldn't accept it if it has that note on that because okay. it isn't accurate. Okay. Well, don't rush out to tell your people to look a little closer. <laughs> um, but no. I, I really have never seen a house location survey that didn't have a note like that someplace on it. Yeah, it, 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 it hopefully we don't approve ones that have that because that, you know, that subjects mm. us to too much. So, but, um, yeah. and, and well, I know as a contractor, I, when I'm on the line, we require a boundary survey from the customer just yeah. to protect everybody. So. It's a good practice, yes. Um, also, in, in addition to the site plan requirements, I, I know one of the, I guess the questions too are what the pit, what are the pitfalls or what are the things, the common mistakes we see or things that tie up reviews. The clearer your information is on, on a site plan, I mean, in terms of zoning, we're checking setbacks, we're checking building height, we're checking use and things, but for a site plan, make it clear what you're proposing. Provide your setbacks to your closest property line, setbacks being a perpendicular from the property line to the closest point of the house, not a perpendicular off the house to the property line. Um, also, where you have to provide for a building height, show your calculation uh, somewhere on that, whether it's your cover sheet. If you have a cover sheet and you have a site plan insert, make sure you have those calculations on your cover sheet, as well as your calculations of, of how you're determining your size of your ADU when, when you have those three options and you have to provide uh, what they are. Also, with ADUs, you have to provide parking. And parking is, if it's an existing driveway, one of those spaces has to be allocated to the ADU. If it happens to be a property that doesn't have a driveway, and you then you have to build that driveway, you have to provide for two spaces. So we'll be looking for those on the site plan. Um, and then lastly, one of the services we provide, which is a great service, is the design consultation. And what that is, is that's a preliminary consultation prior to making your submission. It's a perfect opportunity to ask all your questions that, that you have before having to actually submit plans that may possibly get denied or may be insufficient because you didn't get the opportunity to ask the questions. It's a free service to the applicants. It's an on, it's online application, it's virtual. You set up your own appointment and I have this, this is from our website. Um, you, when you go to the website, you see this button that says design consultation. You click on that, that takes you to a calendar. You pick the date that works for you. It shows which dates are open, you click on it. Once you click on that and say, I wanna set that date, it's gonna give you a questionnaire that asks, gives you all these boxes to check for all the questions you have. And the more thorough you are with that, the more productive your design consultation will be because we have a coordinator who pulls all the, the the correct disciplines to be in that pre-design meeting so that we can assist you the best we can to answer all your questions so your application can be complete as possible. You bring with you to that appointment or the virtual appointment, anything you have that you've started to prepare or anything that you need to help uh, ask your questions, but it's it's a great tool we provide that for commercial construction as well as residential, um, but it, it it really helps to, it, it's, it's hard sometimes to be chasing down reviewers, and if you don't have a reviewer contact, this gets everybody in a room, and you can get all your questions answered right away, plus you get your contact information for who to reach out to for any additional questions you may have but I think it's a, it's a great service we provide. 
And with that, um, we'll open it up for questions. Suppose you just had a quick question that you needed an answer to rather than scheduling a whole design consultation. Who would you call? If you don't already have a contact person, um, if it's if it's zoning related, you you can you can start with me. And and actually, the best thing is to shoot me an email, um, and and I can direct that question to somebody. Or you can look on our website under contacts. If if you look, we have all the divisions broken down whether it's if it's land development if it's commercial whatever and then all the reviewers are listed so you can you can pick a name off of of there if it's a zoning question you can pick a name off of there um but if you have somebody you've worked with in the past the best thing is to reach out to that person i think that's what most of us do yeah so what about the rest question. of you who's got a hand up debbie do You've got a question? Uh, yes, Tamara has a question to everyone. Any suggestions on how to determine or confirm easements and or covenants? Surveys and plats don't always include this information and owners don't always know. Well, one of the things is if, if you do a full boundary, the surveyor should be doing a title search and getting all that information and that should be provided on that boundary. If, if you don't know, you can look at, uh, we have, uh, you can go to plats.net and look and see if the record plat for your property shows any easements. Uh, if it's it's tough for it, if it's a homeowner or somebody, I mean, you, you can go to the tax, uh, not the, you go to the courthouse and research it, but that's that's a tough one for somebody who's not in in this industry to have to figure that out um but typically the surveyor if they're doing a boundary in topo uh a full boundary in topo they would they would do that title search to get that information and provide it on the plan okay yeah i think um it's come up on a few of our projects where we're doing a small addition and we were you know determining if we should do the full boundary uh, survey or the house location, but we don't have the information if there are any covenants or easements. So that's where we're, why this question has been coming up. It, it's it's typically found in a title search, but I don't know unless somebody else on the call has a has an answer for that. That's well, I I can share with you that Montgomery County has a very robust map system. And we could schedule a whole call probably on getting trained on how to use that map system. But it seems to me there's overlays that show easements and things like that. But that's where I pick up contour information. And, um, you know, it's amazing how much stuff is there, but it's hard to navigate. Okay. Yeah. If there's any information on that resource, that would be, that'd be great. Thank you. I put in the chat what we had mentioned we would be covering. Um, I just want to make sure that we, everything was covered in there. Is it might help with some questions? If you guys can see that. Well, I think the information that you um, gave us about the cheat sheet, I know I always thought you guys were pulling those adjustments for setbacks out of the secret book or something that nobody could see um, so and i don't remember seeing that on the last version of that sheet that i had so i'll download a current version of it but that's really helpful because i work in a lot of older neighborhoods that are recorded way back when well it is in the secret book but that secret book being that zoning ordinance is very difficult to navigate sometimes so yeah uh, even even those of us who use it all the time i still have to say where is that again i know i've <laughs> seen it and where is it but i just find those cheat sheets very helpful when an application comes into you for review do you divide it up to some of your reviewers specialize in residential and some in commercial or are they all general purpose and take whatever comes in as it comes in? 
there are some of the permits go to all the reviewers. Um, I, I'm trying to get everybody so that they can go to everybody, but currently we have certain reviewers who specifically do, again, some of the more challenging type of reviews, which would be the demo rebuilds or some of the larger additions. Um, but the majority of the reviewers can do everything, but some of the more difficult ones are, are confined to the senior plan reviewers. I'm more concerned with the easy ones like a fence going in and out of the system, you know, as quickly as possible. Yeah, those can go to any of the reviewers and those are typically the quicker turnaround time frames. Um, we, we try and our, our goal is to get all permits turned around within seven days. Fences can can take one to three days, depending upon some the 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 volume of fences, because it's easy to say a fence could be turned around in one day, but sometimes we have some of these fence contractors who will submit 30 permits one day. You know, they just bulk them all and submit them. Well, we we can't commit to turning that many around that quick, but it, you know they do get spread out amongst the reviewers. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? When, um, I don't know how to ask this. <laughs> Just real quick, um, it's Victor again. Um, I, 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 I do want Amy to be provided an opportunity to speak, so I, um, and I'm just curious, Amy, as a reviewer, what types of mistakes do you usually see that um, that result in a protracted timeline in the issuance of a permit um, or review? Well, thinking about common mistakes, one of the most common ones I've seen, I started to see more and more nowadays is the setback distance is not measured from the building corner that's closest to the property line, and it's not measured perpendicular to the property line. They just extend the building line to, to hit the property line and say, okay, that's the setback, but that's not the setback. And it's not going to be a big issue if the house or the proposed addition structure is sitting on a large property, but a lot of times nowadays, the properties are tight. So you extend the line and say the setback is eight feet. The minimum setback is seven, but we all know that extended line is longer than the perpendicular measurement. So for that issue alone, I have to send it back, I have to deny it. But if it's measured in the first place, say perpendicular from that corner to the property line and showing seven feet minimum, great. Then if everything else is fine, the permit will get past zoning with no delay. That's one thing. And another thing is uh, this happens with additions because we need to calculate. Sometimes I send things back because I ask for calculations is if the proposed improvement is demolishing more than 50% of the existing building or adding more than 50% of the existing building, the square footage, it becomes an infill development. And we don't know, like just by looking at the plan, sometimes I say, oh, it's closed, but they don't give me a calculation. So I have to send it back and asking for the calculation for the existing house footprint and asking the demolition and asking for the square footage of the addition. So like this kind of thing, if it's proposed, if it's given to us in the first place, then it's all there, great. You know, we don't have to send it back. And another thing is like, we see a lot of additions on the second floor, the existing house is just basement with a first floor. And then now they're adding a second floor. The second floor, they just say, okay, the building height is 25 feet. But for this, I still need to see the average front grade calculation. We need to see the sea level elevation. We sometimes we even accept the GS because people sometimes we don't, they don't want to do a full survey because they want to cut cost. And for that, we say, okay, they will argue. They will say, okay, well, it's existing house. The grade doesn't change. I know it doesn't change, but you're adding a floor. So the height increase. In that case, I need to see the sea level elevation. And I need to see the, floor, the average front grade calculation. And I need to see the calculation from the finished first floor to the, either the peak of the roof or the midpoint of the roof. So that information is needed for us to review. 
And another thing is lot coverage. Again, nowadays people are adding to the property, you're getting close to the lot coverage. If you give us the lot coverage calculation in the, in the first place, I don't have to send it back and ask for it. So that like help things move forward faster. And yeah, also another thing is, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, when people asking how big their accessory structures can be, we always tell them, okay, uh, it needs to be, cannot be more than 50% of the principal house footprint or 600 square feet, whichever is greater. People mistakenly think that the principal house is the total square footage. No, it's not. It's only the footprint. We see a lot of mistakes. They say, they say, oh, my house is 3,000 3, square feet. No, it's not. It's only like about a little bit over 1,000 square feet in footprint. So that's a mistake I see a lot of people make. And the one more thing is about the accuracy of the house location plan. I have seen the house location plans with a plus and minus five feet, three feet. Those are no good. We will not accept that. And sometimes if it's a really small project and they say the plus minus one foot, and we'll say, yeah, maybe that's fine, especially like that set proposed structure is not that close to that minimum required seven feet. But I still will ask them to label the proposed setback, say, hey, minimum, like say eight feet, nine feet, because we don't want to see like eight feet and plus minus or seven feet plus minus, because once that minus, it's six feet, you don't meet the setback again. So that's the things I can think of at this moment. Great. Um, and we also have, I, I, I want to recognize someone late here that uh, I did not see her name on the list um, when I was doing introductions was, is uh, Dallas Mary Ellis, who is a residential plan reviewer. And since we have um, someone who also see, sees some of your items, I'm just wondering um, if you have anything that you'd like to add in addition to what, to what um, Amy has brought forward to the group. Yes, hello everyone. Sorry, I was a little late. I was with a customer. Um, now this has been very uh, thorough and a lot of information was given, but maybe I wanted to add um, when uh, the amount of demolition that um, we see a lot of them uh, homes that do large amount of demolitions and uh, large additions. And, and when this becomes a new home permit, um, I know we are working on clarifying this um, requirement, but as of now, if you are demolishing the most of the house, but not leaving the front elevation or existing front elevation or facade, and it's supporting a structure standing, then that can no longer be applied as, a, as an addition permit. It should be applied as a new home permit, even if the basement is not being demolished. And if the amount of demolition exceeds 50% of the existing floor area above grade, then you will require to install automatic sprinkle system in that addition. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if anybody has a plan review question for me. <clears throat> okay. Um, thanks. I, um... You're welcome. Why don't you, um, Patricia, you could stop sharing the, the PowerPoint. And um, I just want to open the floor up to, to Jim, who is our residential inspections manager, um, or Linda, who's our division chief for land development, or, our, or our, um, our acting director, if you guys would like to add anything to um, what we've already presented to the group. For me, I just uh, enjoyed uh, learning all that, uh, filling in the holes of my knowledge of zoning. So uh, uh, thank you very much, zoning team. So, so uh, Victor, I just want to thank you for the presentation. Excellent job by the group. As usual, it was really informative. So thank you to your team. Uh, hopefully, the ProMid Atlantic Remodeling group found this uh, PowerPoint very useful and beneficial to what they are doing in Montgomery County, uh, because as they go, especially when they're dealing with outside, 
those are the outdoor, uh, you're gonna come across a lot of these setbacks and uh, issues with the uh, other things that come up, you know, regarding the property line, you know, question we're going back and forth about one or two feet. Those things are never gonna be approved by us, especially when you're looking at a wall check, one or two feet, hey, there goes the setback. We don't even consider one or two inches, yet along one or two feet. Question about you want to get a hold of a plan review or somebody 311, please. 311 is what we Ooh. advertise all the time. Uh, it's really you call people, you're going to have a hard time getting a hold of them because, as you know, you guys are busy. You guys are extremely busy. So, you know, we are busy. Uh, so, please use 311 as much as you can. That's why it's there to help all you guys. So, you know, we, we usually return those phone calls within a day or two, especially zoning is extremely good with that. Other than that, I really don't have anything else to do. You know, I enjoyed it. And I don't know if the group has any question, more question for me, Linda, everybody else that is over here. But it was very good for me to meet the group. So hopefully we can continue this and, and, and have more productive meetings in the future. Yes, we certainly hope to, to keep that going. But since I see all of you there together and all this new knowledge about zoning, from my perspective, when I submit a permit application, I only have one concern, and that's how long is it going to take to get the permit after the, you know, it's submitted. And I can see, you know, if I put something on there that zoning is going to deny, it makes the entire project infeasible, how, okay, that's a step that I think takes place before the permit review process takes place. Is there an official sequence? of it gets submitted, the technician looks at it, then zoning does it, and then it goes to DPS for the architectural and structural. Does it have to wait or do they happen simultaneously? And same thing for land development. When do you weigh into that? Um, I, I think I can answer this, Dave. Um, so the electronic, all the applications come in electronically now. And um, for residential building permits, the zoning review does get done first. So does well and septic, because those two reviews could end up changing the siting of the addition. There, there are multiple factors that go into yeah. those two. Once that has occurred, everything else opens up, and including it goes to Mariella for her to do her review and what have you. But when the application comes through the door for land development, as soon as it hits the door, we don't necessarily, we absolutely do not have a task in project docs. So we're not in there reviewing the plans at that time, but we do get an email notification and the permit technicians will contact the applicant, whoever's in charge of this project. They will reach out and say, you need a sediment control permit for this scope of work or you need a drainage plan, or you need a restoration of the right-of-way permit. We talked about that the last meeting we had, mm -hmm. right? Um, so that that notification can happen at the same time, and you can be doing your, mm -hmm. if there's a right-of-way requirement or a sediment control permit mm -hmm. requirement, you obviously can, those things can happen concurrently. Um, the only problem is you will not get your building permits until we have issued our permits over here in land development. You know, I think, you know, this discussion today in particular has helped me understand the importance of that sequence and doing it in that order. Uh, otherwise, we're wasting everybody's time. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Correct. And uh, the other takeaway is, you know, the information that goes on the cover sheet. And um, I keep thinking, you know, can I develop a template for this? But then every project we do is a little bit differently and the template is out the window. So, you know, maybe if we can come up with a grand list of things to cover on that cover sheet. Um, but I, I, I know I keep drilling into everybody the importance of a good narrative descriptive on the cover sheet of what we're doing. Thank you. <laughs> so what about anybody else? Closing comments? Praise for our great people. I just wanted to ask here. who Elizabeth is, please. I don't know who that is. Sorry, <clears throat> sorry, I'm Elizabeth with Case Design Remodeling. Oh, okay, hi, great, I'm glad you're hi. with us. <laughs> I wanted to be sure. Do you have oh. any questions? No, no, it was a good conversation. All right, thank yeah. you. 
Yeah, we had a good turnout. Thank you to everyone in Montgomery County for hosting this. And thank you to all the pros out there um, who see the value in this. And uh, thanks. Have a great Christmas. Thank you all so much. Happy holidays. Have and, be safe uh, out there and see you in 2022. Any ideas for the next uh, session, please let us know. Thanks. Thank you thanks, so much. Dave. Thanks, Dave. Bye-bye.